You're thinking about backing casting shadows? Don't you dare do it. Or maybe you should. I guess we'll see. Welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George, and I'm here to give you the five reasons you shouldn't back casting shadows. And right off the bat, let me say this. If you are stumbling upon this channel for the first time, welcome. Now that the pleasantries are done, this is a series that I have been doing for quite some time now, where I attempt to provide a balanced look at any board game campaign that has raised over a million dollars on a crowdfunding platform, like Kickstarter. A million bucks, that's my bar. So one, I'm not picking on a little guy. And more importantly, these campaigns generally come at a pretty high price point, and they do an exceptional job at making you feel like you need the thing. Your life will be incomplete if you don't back. And so my goal with these videos is to not necessarily have you listen to the title of the video and that's it, but that you're equally excited to have these games arrive at your door a year down the line when they finally get there or however long it takes after delays. And so that's the premise of this video series. But this video is different. And honestly, I didn't wanna make this video. I didn't think it needed to be made based upon what I perceive as the general interest of people who tune into this channel. But my patrons wanted it, and what my patrons want, my patrons get. They're the ones who keep the lights on. And they're also, unfortunately, the reason why I had to cover myself in butter and roll around in green glitter on St. Patrick's Day, singing the 10-minute epic, St. Patrick was a sea slug. Way more complicated than the lay of Sir Savian Trowliard. Let me tell you. So I am making this video, but I'm also very aware that if you've made it this far, you either like me as a person, which I am immensely appreciative of, and hey, I like you too. Or, realistically, this may be the first time seeing this channel for a lot of you. And so, if you love Unstable Unicorns, because, as I'm sure you know, this is a game by the same creator, and you got an email from Kickstarter saying, hey, they're producing something else this creator that you've backed and enjoyed your time with that game. By all means, I am thrilled that you are getting your hands on something that brings you joy. And this isn't going to be a video that's putting down funny card games like Unstable Unicorn. I mean, I just did a whole video about welcoming people into the board gaming hobby and I intend to practice what I preach. And so trust me, stick with me. I am not going to discount your personal preferences and our personal preferences, what we search for in games may be completely different. But I really wanna welcome you to the channel and I also think that personal preference aside, I tend to veer towards more complicated than not games are the things that I enjoy. But personal preference aside, I still think there are legitimate reasons why maybe you should reconsider backing Casting Shadows right now. And so I hope I've made that clear. I hope this is a welcoming environment for anyone who is new to this channel and more importantly, new to the hobby because it is a wonderful hobby and just because I'm here shouting don't buy fun things doesn't mean you necessarily have to listen to me. But first off, I always like to start with what I like about a campaign before I go into tearing them down and making everyone cancel their funding entirely. And while I will go into the rules of the game, specifically in our first point, I gotta say that right off the bat, the art and the theme really bring me in. I mean, to be fair, the art and the theme of something like Pokemon bring me in. Not that this is similar to that, whatsoever. But I do like that you get to be Ninetales, Charizard, Dragonair, or even Garurumon as your character. That's a Pokemon, right? <laughs> With Blastoise on the side teaching you some water spells. <laughs> and going back to that comment about complexity and, and my enjoyment of complexity, I really do like that this feels like the next iteration in the Unstable Unicorns line that will help people dip their toes into the wide world of board gaming. I mean, this one has such terminology as action selection, resource management, even worker placement to an extent. Variable player powers, these sorts of ideas form the foundations of a lot of modern board games nowadays. And I would argue to anybody who may be new to the hobby who has stumbled upon this video, that if you think this game looks cool, there is a wide variety of games out there that employ similar things at varying levels of complexity. And I think that is a great, great thing. And I have to say, this is definitely the most interesting for me from a gamer's perspective, to use that sort of clunky turn of phrase, that the Unstable Unicorns team has created. I mean, at least I think so. <laughs> I will admit, I was dreading looking into this campaign and I am pleasantly surprised to see what it will bring to the table. I would happily play this game without any qualms 
without any snobbery whatsoever. And I find that all games nowadays describe themselves as an immersive, strategic game. And I was ready to go on a pretty substantial tangent. As somebody who really enjoys heavy strategic games, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine when every single little pretty much random card game under the sun describes themselves as a strategic game. I mean, obviously there will be a tiny bit of strategy, I suppose, if it provides you any choice at all. If you're choosing between two things, I suppose people stretch that into calling it a strategic game or saying you have strategic choices, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those choices will be interesting. And so I was prepared to do a whole segment roasting this if it didn't have strategic choices and just, well, choices, which I think there is a difference. But I also believe that this game does just scrape by. <laughs> I think there will be interesting choices here throughout the gameplay. When I assumed the only draw to this game was its outer sort of shell and not its inner workings, that's that's exciting. That's that's relieving <laughs> to me. <laughs> and it makes me genuinely happy for the people who are getting it. And I think there will be enjoyment from those who do get it. But enough of this. That's That's enough excitement for one day. It's time to switch and bring the drama, do a complete 180, be completely mean, and abandon this calm demeanor that I've presented up until now. Let's get into the five reasons you shouldn't back casting shadows. If you are currently back, if you're not currently backing, uh, uh, the obvious sixth reason is, meh, not interested. <laughs> As it is with everything. <laughs> but if you are backing, I still think that these might be valuable to you. And our reason number five is that you are backing solely on name recognition or because you just like the art. And it's all well and good to get an email from Kickstarter saying, hey, this creator that you like is creating something new, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should back it sight unseen because it is significantly different from their previous fare. And I don't know if you will enjoy this one, if you only enjoy that previous style of game. So let's get into the actual rules, as promised in that other section that we just finished. <laughs> Because the basic premise of this game is that you want to be the last cuddly creature standing. And you'll do that by obliterating your opponents, battle royale style, slinging spells at them, whittling down their health points until there's only one creature left. You'll have these seven locations and each location will always have a card next to it. And you move around on a map to a specific location and then you spend resources. You roll a bunch of dice at the beginning of your turn and get resources and then you'll use those resources to purchase the cards or to cast spells that you have already purchased and use those spells to either get more resources or bonk everyone else over the head. <laughs> and that premise is pretty decent. And like I mentioned before, I believe it is the next step in complexity from something like Unstable Unicorns, but it might actually be two or three steps up from that. And some of you may not want that sort of complexity, or some of you may not want these extra steps. You may not enjoy the engine building aspect of it. When one player has so many conversion spells, they're able to just double their gems on their turn and buy everything you they want, and you're left there with a limp little fireball, which was coincidentally my nickname in high school. You may not like having to remember what everybody else's spells are that they have and trying to calculate the range at which they can hit you with those spells. And that might slow the game down. Honestly, I don't think it's the type of game where you're meant to pay attention to that sort of thing. You're just gonna cast your spells all real quick and see who wins. And I personally like the balance of having to pick, oh, do I pick this spell that deals damage? Or do I pick this spell that helps me get more gems so I can get spells that deal more damage down the line. I think this might be a neat thing to juggle, but if I'm saying anything that has surprised you or made you realize that you haven't read the rule book and don't understand the game and backed it primarily on the backs of it being definitely not Pokemon, that's important to note. If you're just interested in the art instead of the actual gameplay, well, you could just go buy a t-shirt over on Tea Turtle because it's the same person. Now, reason number four you shouldn't get Casting Shadows is if you don't like player elimination. And this may not affect those of you who enjoy Unstable Unicorns, although I don't believe there is player elimination in that. But I think this is a somewhat of a flaw that a lot of games used to fall into. Because if one person just dies early on, they just have to sit out 
and watch while everybody else finishes the game. That's the nature of these sorts of things. Or one person can get ganged up on and get eliminated early on and then again be forced to sit out and watch everyone else have fun. Or flip the table, don't have to sit out, but never get invited back to game night. And this is also why I think getting the five to six player expansion, which is one of the upgrades that they attempt to push on you, isn't actually a good idea. The turns do look like they will be fairly quick, but when you add in more people, that's more people that you have to keep track of, more people that you have to talk to. And I think with six players, if someone is eliminated early on, that's more people that they have to wait and wait out before they get a chance to play again. Not to mention combining that with the time in between turns, I I think the benefit to these sorts of games is that they go quickly and you're throwing spells at each other and you're always doing something and the pace moves fairly quickly. But with six players, if everybody takes even just a minute to decide what they do on their turn, that's five minutes where someone isn't really engaged in the action. And I think that five minutes is a fairly decent estimate. And I do know that because I won a gold medal in estimation math when I was in grade six. And it is, yes, my proudest achievement. So keep in mind the particular players that you will be playing with and how much enjoyment they would lose if they're eliminated halfway through and have to wait a half an hour before they get to engage with the group again. Now, reason number three you shouldn't back is if you own more than 20 games. I mean, you can see behind me, I am an addict, I have a problem, and that problem is too much fun. But likely, if you have a larger collection, the chances are fairly high that you will have something that gives you the same feeling as this does. And I'm a big pusher of the idea that games have feelings. Games have lots of feelings and they deserve to be nurtured. No, games can provide a feeling, very similar to movies. Sometimes you feel like a psychological thriller and sometimes you feel like watching a Marvel movie. But my bet is if your game collection is 20 or more, or even let's say 30, if it's gotten to that point where you feel like you have a collection, you need, you need a designated shelf for that collection, my bet is you likely have something that will do the same thing. For me, if I want a game with player elimination where everybody stabs each other in the back, I'll play a little game called Coup which is fantastic. If I want something where I get gems over and over and multiply those gems so I can get better cards, I'll play a game called Splendor. If I want something that plays well at six and gives that battle royale feeling, where it's the last person standing, only one can be the king of the hill, well, then I'll play King of Tokyo, which plays very well at six. So I guess my advice here is take a serious look at your collection, see if you have something that will feel like this game, I mean, honestly, the Splendor thing was a stretch. It isn't going to be that much engine building in this game whatsoever. I was just using it to illustrate my point. But if you feel like this game, Casting Shadows, will be unique enough to warrant a place on your shelf and will remain unique enough in the year it takes to get to you, get it. If not, think about if you will play something else consistently instead and if this will be relegated to that shelf. Speaking of other games, here's some other games that it reminds me of that I don't own. Black Rose Wars, where you're moving around on a hex-based board and throwing spells at each other. This one is arguably a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated. Vindication, where you're moving around on a hex-based board, interacting with those hexes to give you specific bonuses depending where you are on the map, and also trying to flip your character over to its shadow form. Actually, you're trying to get it out of its shadow form, pretty much, but... There's seasons where you roll dice and get resources and use those resources to purchase cards which allow you to do different things and attack your opponent. There's no board in that one. I mean, you can do this with a lot of games and say, hey, all games are the same, they're just in a box. Is your game in a box? Well, there's the comparison. <laughs> but in essence, really think about the feeling and when you're gonna be pulling it out and if something else takes the cake for that moment. For me, hands down, it would be coup because it also plays quicker, and then the player elimination isn't such a big deal either. Now, reason number two is that it will be cheaper at retail, and that's just a fact. That's just the truth. There's no world in which this will be more expensive at retail. And this will be widely available because Unstable Unicorns is, Here to Slay is, this has raised over $2 million Canadian and is doing very well and it will be readily accessible. But the trick is, you won't have to pay the extra $10 to $20 in shipping if you just go to your local store. <laughs>
oftentimes local stores will have discounts or sales that you can pick these things up at. So save yourself the shipping money, save yourself that extra dough, wait for a sale if you want it, and it will come around. You don't need it the instant the boats dock at your country. <laughs> you can probably wait a month. And on top of that, that's just for the base game. Everything else feels really overpriced by today's standards. Sure, the Kickstarter edition, which they are pushing for you, which is at that $39, so it's the same as 30, but it's 39, that might, might as well be the same thing, it's not 40, what savings? <laughs> you get a cardboard dice tower and a few extra cards and these two different mats. I honestly understand that markup, I don't think the $9 markup from what you're getting is necessarily that huge, but remember it's not a $9 markup, it's more like a $19 markup because you have to factor in that shipping. But then when you continue to go up the tier, I mean, they're charging you $70 for glorified mouse pads. Pretty mouse pads, but uh, mouse pads nonetheless. They're also offering acrylic standees, and you don't need acrylic standees unless you have a child or a dog with a major saliva problem. And even still, that would take a lot of saliva to work its way through those tiny little meeples <laughs> that come with the game. And if that is the case, then I recommend you spend your $56 on uh, napkins or a door rather than <laughs> these extra acrylic standees, which are incredibly overpriced. Skinny Minis do the same thing. They put out 32 different little standees in their bundle every month, and you can get those for $17 US instead of 56. And don't even get me started on the vinyl figures. Yeah, they're cute, but they are not worth $160. Just get yourself to Walmart and buy 24 tiny, janky, yet functional Pokemon figures for $14 Canadian. <laughs> These sorts of extras, I do not believe, provide the value compared to the exorbitant price point that they are attempting to ask for. So really check if you're getting swept up in the marketing and swept up by how cute these figures are that you're spending $150 or $250 on this very simple game that you can probably get at retail for $25. And finally, the number one reason why you shouldn't back Casting Shadows is that Kickstarter exclusives don't matter. They don't. When I first started looking at this Kickstarter, I thought this was going to be a hard one to do, a hard video to make, because I thought, oh, there's no way that the fear of missing out will be pushed so wholeheartedly on this sort of smaller price point campaign as it is in a lot of these larger ones. It's a very large proponent to try to get people to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. But man, oh man, was I wrong. Everything you look at is emphasized that it is Kickstarter exclusive. And they are constantly pushing upon you this narrative of this is exclusive, this is exclusive. You will miss out if you don't get it now. Get it now, give us money now before you can change your mind and get all these exclusive things that nobody else has. And I understand this mentality and I understand that it is fun sometimes to have these little exclusive promos. It's absolutely fun. I recognize that. But the truth is, in a lot of these cases, these exclusives never matter when it comes to the actual game itself. And I'm talking specifically about gameplay here, which is generally why I play games for the game experience. And I cover a lot of games on this channel, and on every Monday morning, I have a show devoted directly to Kickstarters and the Kickstarter campaigns that are finishing up, and almost always the Kickstarter exclusives never significantly impact the gameplay itself. And the reason for this is because publishers have to think about the longevity of their games. Now, sometimes you will get free expansions that will be sold at retail at a later date, and so you are getting a better deal on these sorts of expansions. That's a different model. That's not what we're talking about here. But any expansion or any gameplay component that has a Kickstarter exclusive tag generally doesn't matter. It has to not matter. Because as a publisher, you want your game to be great. You don't want your game to be great for a small subset of people and exclude the rest of the population. No, you want your game to be great across the board. <laughs> And you are going to spend your time testing that the base game, the game that is going to retail, is the best version of the game possible. 
and you are going to test that out fully before you designate time into testing these other things. This is why a lot of board gamers often complain that the Kickstarter exclusives are unbalanced and shouldn't even be in the game to begin with because publishers don't spend that much time on them. So sure, it is easy to get pulled in by the allure that everything is exclusive. This means it will be a complete game, but that is, I think, very false. Or at least nine out of 10 times false. So that's number one. Look at how many times they mention Kickstarter exclusives on this campaign and recognize that they're doing that on purpose. And that is to make sure you back right now. Anyway, that's it. I've talked on long enough. <laughs> Realistically, this isn't one that I actually need to talk you out of. Unless you're getting the $150 price point or the $250 price point, in which case, girl, <laughs> check yourself. I mean, if you think those things will bring you that additional joy, great. But I, I just, I just don't believe it to be so. But for the base pledge, it's relatively cheap. It might be the cheapest ever in this series of five reasons you shouldn't back in the history of since I've started covering over $1 million Kickstarters. So you don't have to listen to me. I'm just here to try to make sure you have an informed purchase and to give you that check to say you probably have something that does the, this job already. Or maybe you don't. And if not, hey, I hope you get it and you love it and you have many wonderful game nights to come. Anyway, I'm done. <laughs> thank you for sticking with me. Uh, no thank you to my patrons for making me both do this video and the 24 hour gum in the hair challenge that we have scheduled. I need some backup. I hope this video was somewhat helpful or entertaining. And if it was neither of those, well, I still enjoyed hanging out with you. The one thing I hope for casting shadows, and the one thing I actually think it will end up doing, is get more people a little bit further along the trail to being fully and completely obsessed with the board gaming hobby and having it consume their entire lives as it does mine. Can't wait to see y'all when you get there. <laughs> anyway, thanks everyone again for watching. My name's Chris George. Ah, uh, oh dang it, I don't. I do not have a catchphrase, but let me leave you with these very well done Pokemon impressions. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Those are horrible. Huh? Huh? <laughs> I, you know, when I was when I was eleven, I used to be able to, I used to be a lot better at these. No, my Digimon used to be good. Agumon, Agumon, Digivolve, two. That was good. No. Panamon! Pa! No, it's just Julie. All right, we're done. <laughs> Get out of here. What are you still doing here? You gotta go back where you belong. Don't now. you hear this music underneath? <laughs> that means go. Come on! Why won't you just leave?